The future of local sports media is playing out in bankruptcy court. The Athletics' Evan Drellick joins us later to sort through everything going on there. Plus, the NFL schedule will be taxing on certain teams, but does accommodate the league's favorite fan. And EA's College Football 25 has a release date 11 years after the last edition of the franchise. It's Friday, May 17th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NFL has released its schedule, and this could be an exhausting year for some teams. Bill Sparrows of the Boston Herald ran the numbers, and the team that will travel the most this coming season is the Los Angeles Chargers, who will log just under 27,000 miles. Seven teams, the Commanders, Bengals, Colts, Steelers, Falcons, Saints, and Titans, will do less than half of that. The Dolphins, Seahawks, and Patriots are the other biggest travelers, with over 25,000 on their itineraries. Lots of travel isn't especially new for teams. But something else is, last year the NFL scrapped a rule that limited the number of times each team would have to play on short rest to once per season. This year, 14 teams will have to do it twice. The league justified this change by saying that injuries are no more likely to happen on Thursday night games, but that conveniently ignores the more nebulous issue of how much long-term wear those shorter weeks put on players' bodies. There's at least one person whose travel schedule is being taken into consideration with the schedule, however, and that's Taylor Swift. The NFL's VP of Broadcast Planning, Mike North, acknowledged that the league's most famous fans' tour schedule was a factor in planning out the next year. College Football 25 from EA Sports will be released on July 19th and feature Michigan's Donovan Edwards, Texas's Quinn Ewers, and Colorado's Travis Hunter on the cover. The release will end an 11-year hiatus. The game ceased production following a lawsuit from several players over the use of their names, images, and likenesses. This, of course, was before the Supreme Court allowed players to profit off their NIL rights. Now, 11 years later, EA is working with the NIL era in a way that has no real precedent. Every Division I player was offered $600 and a copy of the game to allow EA to use their name, image, and likeness. While more than 10,000 athletes said yes, some, including Arch Manning, turned them down. Eventually, deals like this may be collectively bargained, but for now, EA can work directly with each individual player as it prepares to launch one of the most anticipated titles in a decade. And Spulu finally has a name. The sports-focused tie-up of Disney, Fox, and Warner Bros. Discovery will be called Venue Sports. The release date, price, and most other details are still to be announced for the streaming service, which will come out sometime before the NFL season. At that point, we will likely know if WBD was able to hang on to its NBA media rights. Lawyers for MLB, the NBA, and NHL are asking increasingly pointed questions over the viability of Diamond Sports Group as it looks to pull out of bankruptcy despite being dropped by Comcast Networks. The results of Diamond's bankruptcy hearings will be a major determinant of future revenues on all three leagues and will also impact their abilities to map out their media futures. The Athletics' Evan Drellick has been tracking this entire issue very closely, and he joins us next. Joined once again by Evan Drellick, senior MLB writer with The Athletic. Welcome back, Evan. Oh, and thanks for having me. Always great to have you on, uh, especially in our ever confusing times. So uh, the MLB local media situation continues to have more questions and answers, but let's at least try to figure out some of the questions. So we can start with the most recent news. Diamond Sports Group, which holds the rights to its 12 teams right now, um, three of them on one-year deals. Uh, they are in a carriage dispute with Xfinity, owned by Comcast. What's the basic story here? I, the same basic story that exists in every carriage dispute is that uh, it's about money. And sure. the way the money shows up, at least to some extent here, is through tiering and, and how quickly it gets moved to a premium tier. So uh, Comcast Xfinity wants to put the diamond channels on a, on a premium higher tier than it's been on before, um, which, which is happening with other distribution deals. But there's nuance to how quickly that happens. Are people grandfathered in? And it affects the total dollars that uh you know and that a consumers end up paying for a channel to comcast xfinity and also the number of people who ultimately receive diamond channels and that trickles down to how much money um you know the diamond channels can charge for advertisers and so on and so forth so it, it, it's a bottom line argument uh, about dollars but the the question of tiering sits at the center of it and so it sounds like Comcast, Xfinity are saying, look, like only so many people want to watch baseball or to want, want to watch their local sports teams. And so we're going to, then so they're going to pay extra, like almost as if this was like a little streaming service on top of what you get if you're, you're just your basic Xfinity package. And, and Diamond, I'm sure is saying, no, no, everyone wants to watch baseball. Um, is that, that the basic uh, dispute here? 
Yeah, but it, but it, without the specific numbers, it's hard to um, pin it down exactly because, again, in the other deals that uh, Diamond has reached, there has been a move to tiers. So the question becomes, well, what is the rates involved? Uh, you know, is it is it that you're you're ultimately reducing the number of people who are a viewing it and also uh, significantly reducing the amount of money that is going to Diamond? That would probably be Diamond's complaint, right? You you can. You can get to the total dollars in different ways. Um, you know, you, you have a lower rate per customer and it reaches more customers or, you know, higher rate per customer and it's reaching fewer customers and, and somewhere in there, and we don't have the specifics, or at least I haven't seen it reported anywhere. Um, there is a significant disagreement on those total dollars. Mm -hmm, got it. And, um, and just before we move on from this, any sense of like how this is going to resolve itself or is it just like at some point they'll probably make a deal or they won't I mean, sometimes these things don't really end in a deal but yeah any any direction you see this going well I, it would be kind of surprising if, it, if a deal isn't reached it, it is important to diamond which is in the middle of the bankruptcy proceeding to reach a deal uh and i think yeah. comcast is aware of that that's that's a pretty you know, if, if you were on their side of the fence, wouldn't that be something you would want to try to leverage is sure. uh, the fact that Diamond has a June, mid-June, I think it's June 18th confirmation hearing for its plan to emerge from bankruptcy. So there's a pressure point coming up here. Uh, it, it doesn't mean it couldn't be pushed back. It, it, it's possible. But uh, I think in a way, the mo most interesting question is not whether they reach a deal, at least not at this point. You know, it hasn't dragged on long enough that you're like, wow, they, they really might never come together. It, it, it's a bit of, well, once they do reach a deal, what do the economics look like for Diamond? You know, they, they've reached a deal with DirecTV, they've reached a deal with Charter, they, they have a deal with Cox, and if they get the deal with, Com with Comcast, okay, put it all together. How does it add up? Does it look like that that's really enough to sustain Diamond in this new company, this new Amazon-backed plan coming out of bankruptcy or not? So that, in a way, the most interesting thing is the long-term question of whatever this diamond Comcast deal ends up looking like, uh, you know, how good or bad is it uh, for, mm -hmm. for diamond in particular, because diamonds futures, the one that's really hanging in the balance here. Right. So yeah, let's, let's get into that even more. So yeah, diamonds and bankruptcy talks right now, or they're trying to emerge from bankruptcy as, as a functional company again. Uh, does it look like that is actually going to happen? Yeah, you don't usually reach this point in the process, the bankruptcy process, and have it um, not be confirmed. It's not impossible. I mean, there's a reason they go through these steps. Uh, but the judge and the and the um, uh, the various creditors have already uh, approved the disclosure statement, which is kind of the preliminary prospectus of of here. Here's what we intend to do, uh, and so now in June. It, it's the more final, okay, this is the plan or not. Um, if someone's going to object, we haven't, it's not clear who that, who that's going to be. Uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, at one point, uh, some of the unsecured creditors uh, raised a hand, but that was already earlier in the process. So um, yeah, I think they're going to emerge from bankruptcy with this Amazon back plan. And then the question is, how long does it last? Is it, is it good to go or, or are there still questions? Um, and, you know, we're just not going to know that until we get more, A until, B, A, until time passes, and B, until we have more information on those underlying economics. How much money is actually coming in to, to Diamond? You know, they, they, the projections Diamond put forth in court, uh, you know, I talked to third-party bankruptcy lawyers who aren't involved in this case, but experienced people, everybody's a little skeptical of the numbers that diamond is saying it, it can do in terms of um dtc subscribers direct to consumer it's just um it, it's still an open question even if they emerge from bankruptcy how long does does diamond last do they last um and maybe they will but we're just not sure yet yeah i mean for me it if they want to just keep existing as a, a company that is primarily on cable and you know also has some amount of streaming offering i mean that doesn't seem to be working maybe they could do a slimmed down version of that but i'm not quite sure what that would look like it feels to me like if there's going to be a long-term situation here that is actually profitable i feel like amazon has to have a, a prominent role which is you know presumably why they are 
uh, contributing $450 million to this whole situation. Um, so yeah, a- any any sense of like what this could look like or and, and how Amazon could be involved? You know, it's, it's interesting. We, we have all these kind of senses. Well, the RSN landscape is collapsing and crumbling and falling apart. I mean, even if you just take baseball, um, Diamond dropped two teams, Arizona and San Diego, and they renegotiated three other teams, um, Cleveland, Texas, and, and Minnesota. Their deal expired, but they, they re-upped on a one-year deal. So that's basically a renegotiation. Um, there are still nine other teams that they haven't touched, right? So the majority of baseball teams that Diamond was working with, basically the, 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 the perception you can walk away with is, well, those deals are working fine. You know, and, and the reality is there isn't money established uh, consistent money coming in through streaming options yet really for anybody. I, I mean, Peacock yeah. losing more than 2 billion in 2023. So it, it's not going to disappear, at least not overnight. I, I think what you've heard people in baseball, commissioner Rob Manfred talk about, and I hear some you know, media consultants talking about is this kind of modified world where uh, the exclusivity gets lessened. So, um, you know, you could broadcast the games simultaneously. Maybe you can stream them and the rights fees get lessened, but, but the, the RSN team relationship still exists. And in baseball, it, it's going to become very important. It, it should have, it was important years ago for these exclusivity arrangements to be loosened and they haven't been. And it means that, you know, if you're in a Comcast territory, you want to watch the twins, uh, and, you, and your Comcast subscriber, well, you're you're not in a great spot here uh, if, if you um, if you subscribe to Comcast because there isn't this alternative streaming option that you can just sign up for uh, available separately. So um, I, I think it's less doomsday and more uh, an altered world. Yeah, I mean, I think that gets it. Just the fact that there isn't really an, an optimal solution here. That's that's just the obvious thing that everyone wants to go toward. I mean, the one thing I can think of is the thing that the uh, the Phoenix Suns and the Utah Jazz are doing where they're over the air. Um, so if you've got the rabbit ears or, you know, the, the modern rabbit ears, you can, you can watch them and they have a streaming service. And maybe one day that streaming service gets lumped into NBA League Pass. Um, uh, but I feel like if there was sort of an obvious place for this to all be headed then the situation would be clear. I mean, not not super clear because Diamond is still trying to exist as a company and they still have these uh, these these exclusive deals. And um, so anyway, all that's to get at the question of, I mean, MLB wants its own sort of full service streaming service where they can have local games on it at some point. Um, they can't really do that as you've written um, as long as, as Diamond exists and has the deals it has. Uh, so what's MLB rooting for in all of this? Um, to be paid for their TV rights. I, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, MLB would like to have a national in-market streaming package, MLB.tv, which has existed for years and is, in my opinion, a great product. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like you can just, it, it works pretty darn well and you can watch uh, any out-of-market game. Uh, it, yeah. Wouldn't it be nice for fans and customers and, and, and anybody who just wants to watch a game to have that as an option for in market, you know? So if yeah. I'm in New York where I am, I want to watch the Mets or the Yankees. I can't do that through MLB TV. And this has been a you know, long running complaint that people have. And this has to deal with, do with the exclusivity deals that uh, the RSNs make with the teams. Um, so, you know, so what I was talking about before, where you get to this world where uh, things get loosened, you know, wouldn't it be great if both could exist? The RSN gets to broadcast the games, pays the team, maybe less money than they do now. And also, you could sign up through um, this package and, and get the games in the same way. I think that's the world that baseball would want the most because that gives you uh, still some some set income, which, you know, if, if baseball were only selling a, a national streaming package, uh, it's a lot less predictable. You know, people can, can uh, walk away whenever. And, and sure, people can, can stop subscribing to cable. But, you know, once you get the box, Typically, you keep the box. It, it, it's yeah. it, you know we see cord cutters, but there, there's I think there's less variability of people going in and out um, of subscriptions when it comes to cable. So uh, they want to be paid. I, I, I yeah. think that's overlooked here. It's like yeah, do they do they want to have a national streaming package? Sure. If that means making a lot less money than they do now, they probably don't want it. 
um, which, yeah. but that's a little bit, you know, cutting off your nose, to spite your face, um, because they do need to broaden their reach. They do need to make it easier for people to access these games. It is, you know, now, now they're, they're, uh, according to my colleague, Andrew Marchand, you know, nearing a deal with Roku. I mean, how many different places are you going to be able to watch a baseball game? It's just, it's, it's a little dizzying. Um, and, and I think you lose people in, in a crowded landscape like that. Yeah, no, I think it's people underestimate um, uh, if you have if it's too not obvious where you're going to watch a game like you, you lose people with with every step you put in, you know, you put in their path. Uh, some people are just like, oh, it's not working. I, I guess, you know, let's watch something else or let's let's go outside. Let's do something else. Um, and and yeah, I mean, it just streaming, I think, is is just. I mean, the RSN model is a problem, but streaming, as you you said, is it's a problem too because yeah, it's not profitable. Like Netflix is profitable. There might be I'm not sure at this point one or two others that are are posting profits, actual profits, but um, but it's it's the future. But the future is taking a long time to get here. So yeah, maybe MLB wants to have everything uh, on one service. I'm sure it'll get there at some point. I mean, but for me. With Amazon coming in, I keep coming back to, I don't know if, if MLB can just have its whole streaming world. Maybe it has MLB TV, but maybe local rights are are primarily on Amazon because there are already so many Prime subscribers because they want you know free delivery on their groceries or whatever. Um, and their Amazon is is bringing more people in, getting more people used to watching sports on it through through Thursday night football and everything else they have. Um, I'm wondering if it makes more sense to just have Amazon be the local streamer uh, long-term um, than it does for MLB to try to get everyone on a new service or get you know casual baseball fans on MLB TV. I feel like MLB TV can be there for the big fans and then just something that you're maybe already on uh, the way you're already on cable, you're already on your, your, you know, your local TV broadcast. Um, if it's just available in a more casual way, I feel like they're going to need that second option in addition to MLB TV because there's not enough, they're not going to get enough eyeballs just from MLB TV. Maybe, but, but, but in a way it's the cart before the horse. And, and I probably should have gone into this a bit in the, in the previous answer. Um, it, you know, these teams control their individual rights. You know, the, uh -huh. you, 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 the Yankees have, a, have, a, have their own deal with Amazon. Right. Uh, yeah. but, but this, this national package that MLB was talking about, this in-market national package that, that the league was, that Manfred said he wanted to launch for 2025 was was uh, targeted to be about half the teams in the league, which you can argue is not enough to, to sell anyway. Um, and some people do argue that. And so it's not, so, so e even if what you're saying is right and makes sense and yeah, you know, have Amazon do it. Well, which teams do you have uh, who are participating? And, right, right. Um, and that's dependent in part on, on what deals are already in place. And, and again, this is why if Diamond emerges from bankruptcy, you know, the deals that the, te that, that the Diamond teams have, you know, they're, they're still in place, right? If Diamond disappeared, the, uh, there would be basically 12 teams that would have their rights back. You, you, you combine those with the, with the handful of teams that MLB right now has, uh, is producing and, and the teams have control of their rights over. Okay, now you've got half the league, but you don't have it otherwise. And so uh, there, there is this end game question that... <laughs> I don't even want to call it an end game, but, but, you know, at some point, if you're going to go to streaming, you've got to stop handing over exclusivity to the RSNs. And when, when the twins deal got done with diamond for this year, one year deal, same with the Rangers, same with the guardians, you know, there was exclusivity again, diamond wanted mm -hmm. that. And, and the teams via MLB granted that uh, at some point, you got to stop doing that. If you want to increase your reach. Uh, even if it means taking a little bit less money from Diamond. Yeah, I mean, no, that's, that's an excellent point. I've been treating MLB teams like a monolith, basically. But um, but yeah, the Yankees have their own deals. <clears throat> the Dodgers have their own deals. They're, and, and they can kind of be independently profitable. They can, um, you know, have a better deal than they would get if they were just, you know, everyone was getting the same deal uh, across all 30 teams. Um, and so, yeah, if you're, you're that twins fan who said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pay for a streaming service where I get the twins and I get some other teams. Well, yeah, those teams are going to be, yeah, the guardians, the Cardinals, you know, maybe the Padres, like, you know, like you're, but you're not going to get probably the Yankees, the, the, the Dodgers, maybe the Cubs, you know, the, the, 
biggest market teams are going to say, you know, actually, it makes more sense for us to do our own thing, uh, which I think just cuts against kind of any kind of long term vision that MLB can have here. That I, I mean, you're, yes, you're hitting the nail on the head. This is a classic big market, small market baseball division where, you know, you if you want to create an all 30 team package, OK, uh, you know, the Yankees sit there and say my rights are, are X times more valuable than the Marlins. Are you paying me X times more uh, to participate in your package? And, you know, the teams control their local rights. It, 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 that's just the way baseball has always operated. So, um, you know, and this is a years long process that, that's going to unfold. Uh, you, you, mm -hmm. you, need, you need current deals to expire, and then you would have to have some alignment of teams and owners to say we, we do or don't want to, to pool together. Um, I, I, I do come back to a reality of wouldn't it be nice if I, I want to be able to watch the 2024 Major League Baseball season. Can I sign up for something that lets me do that? <laughs> right? There's a very basic thing here that kind of unfortunately – you know, falls by the wayside b because of this setup. And um, it, it, I, I got to tell you, it, it's one of, I, I found all this stuff at, when I first started covering it, maybe a bit intimidating. It is actually among the most fascinating things um, that I've come across. And, and uh, because, because it controls everything, right? The, the amount of money that comes from the RSNs or whoever is right. paying for your TV rights influences how much money the teams are going to spend influences the rosters it's it's influences labor deals it it really is kind of the um the thing from with for, the the from which everything else flows uh yeah and so it's uh not, not to get all kind of i don't know uh yeah but it's, it's but yeah this, this is but why this matters but right yeah it's a big deal right yeah and this is, is why like everyone is like clinging to their what they've got so so and as much as they possibly can and diamonds trying to stay in this game where it seems like you know the times have been like why, why are you guys even still here <laughs> like you know what's yeah. in it for you at this point and it's like well uh yeah control of of one of the major revenue streams yeah that that flows to the teams and the players and and everything else um everything you talk about from like labor disputes to like stadium deals like all this stuff that yeah starts with this one big big stream of money no pun intended uh, we'll leave it there. Evan Drellick, thanks so much for joining us. That's it for today. Subscribe and tell a friend you think would enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.